Hi, everybody. Hi. How's it going? It's going well, Zachary. Thank you. Good. Um, maybe you could tell me what you're interested in about addiction or sure. how you came to be here. Well, um, Tim and I have conversations um, often about ways in which I can be involved in the programming that they do here at the Rubin. And this year he reached out about the Brainwave series and uh, there were a few options of uh, potential subjects that I could be engaged in conversation about. And I gravitated toward addiction. Um, uh, I'm a sober person and uh, and so I'm, I'm always interested in the exploration of what it means to be sober, but also what it means to have an addictive personality. And, uh, and so the opportunity to discuss it on another level, um, which is the neuroscientific level, I thought was uh, quite fascinating. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to learning things. Um, and I'm sure you all do too. So, uh, so that's why I'm here. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. Well, that's great. Yeah, this is my first book for um, general audience. I generally write uh, scientific papers that no one reads, <laughs> <laughs> even my own family. Um, so this is a new thing for me, but I'm excited. I, I guess the goal in the book was to be able to um, share what I'd learned over about 30 years, trying to understand this difficult problem, why it's so um, ubiquitous, and yet, um, you know, it's still surprising to hear that, even though probably everybody in here knows somebody who struggles with addiction, we still think, oh my gosh, one in five, as if it's rare. So I think right. there is um, kind of a collective denial and, and misunderstanding. Yeah. Well, I think one place to start, certainly in, in this chaotic society that we live in, is how many different forms of addiction there are. You know, we know the ones that are, you know, most problematic, alcohol and drugs, but, you know, we think about technology as a, a recent form of addiction and something that I think everybody that has a phone in their pocket can relate to, um, you know, not only checking your phone to see who's reaching out to you, but checking your phone for social media platforms and checking your phone for various apps that we all have and rely on for different forms of validation or reinforcement. Or, or dopamine. Or, it's, or dopamine. It's all dopamine, exactly. Yeah. It's all dopamine, so we can get to that. Um, but tell, tell me a little bit, I'm, I'm interested, we were talking before the audience got here a little bit about your experience personally, and it, and it sounded like a, a really interesting story, and I know it's in the book, but uh -huh. tell me a little bit about what, what led you to write this book and how you arrived at the exploration of neuroscience as it relates to addiction. Yeah, um, I started using addictively probably at 13, the first time I took a drink, which was a big drink, and uh, I loved it, really seemed to fill um, I, it seemed to calm those animals running around, you know. It seemed like, oh, this is the ticket to a, to a kind of um, whole life. I really thought that. And so for about 10 years, I never said no to anything. And I, as a result, ended up homeless and being kicked out of three schools. And my family wouldn't talk to me. They asked me to leave the house. Um, so things were really tough when I... I ended up in treatment, and this was in the 80s, so I actually thought treatment was like a spa. I thought I was going to... <laughs> well, that'll help, you know. Just clean me out for a minute. Um, and uh, instead, uh, there were nurses, and as soon as I saw the place, I knew it wasn't going to be that fun. But um, they uh, said that I had a disease and that if I was going to keep on using, I would die. And my little... Uh, kind of evil mind thought, well, diseases can be cured, can't they? So if I fix this, then I'll be able to use, which is hilarious to me now because it was completely arrogant and ignorant. But I, um, I mean, my GPA at the time was like a 1.4 or something, but I somehow managed, because I know how to persist, um, to get into grad school, go do a postdoc. Anyway, so about... I don't know, probably I was clean about 14 or 15 years when I wasn't solving anything. I was still clean um, because I took other people's advice while I was trying to work this out. 
And uh, I thought, you know, I don't, I don't have a solution, nobody has a solution, but I do understand a lot, as Tim was saying, about what's different about people like me and maybe you mm -hmm. um, before we ever start, mm -hmm. and certainly during and even after picking up. So that's what I'm trying to explain in the book. So you embarked on a dual path though, right? One was to stay sober, clean, and the other was to figure out how you could solve this problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that was your educational path. Mm -hmm. So what were your thoughts when you thought diseases can be cured, I can solve this? What were you thinking? You know, my, my thoughts were pretty cloudy at the time. Uh -huh. I hadn't gone a day in 10 years without, you know, lots of weed and alcohol and other things. So. I don't know. I think I was just looking for a back door. Uh -huh. I did not like the idea of anybody telling me I couldn't do anything. Right. And um, I'm better with that now, uh -huh. but not great. Were you, were you <laughs> looking, were you, was your goal a, a neurological solution? Well, so that's interesting. I, you know, it was so natural for me to pick that. My mother said, um, when I said, I'm going to graduate school for neuroscience, she said, you know, you spent the first six years of your life turning over rocks. Mm -hmm. I think the way I think is for the mechanism. Mm -hmm. I don't like the big models with a lot of arrows but no substance. I really felt I am just kind of naturally reductionistic. Mm -hmm. And I fully expected that the explanation for my insanity would be in molecules and genes and chemicals. And so... <laughs> Um, I'm not so sure about that anymore. Mm. I think there's a correlate in the mm. molecules mm. and the genes and the chemicals, but not a cause. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So the genetic line of alcoholism, for example, is something that's proven, right? Sure. Right. Even if you're adopt, you know, if you have family members who have any addiction and even depression or anxiety, you're at increased risk. Uh -huh. Even if you're adopted to some normal family somewhere, right. wherever they are. Right. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fascinated by that idea of what our brains are like before we pick up, you know? Um, so so my, my, my experience, yeah. uh, just for a little bit of background, is, um, you know, I, I was raised in a, a relatively normal family. My father died when I was seven, mm. so I had, uh, I had early trauma in my childhood. Um, but, you know, I had a, a pretty loving relatively stable upbringing. I was super um, concerned with being good and being a good student and being a good kid and all those things. And then I, I discovered my passion, you know, at a pretty young age for, for acting and that really consumed me and I put a lot of energy into that. So, and, and then I went to college for that and I was a very serious actor in college. Um, and then, uh, and then I graduated and then, and then all of my energy went into my career ambitions. So I wasn't really like a huge partier. I didn't have my first drink until I was 17 or 18. Wow. Um, and I didn't smoke pot until I was around the same age. Um, and I, I, I engaged those things relatively normally, I think, you know, in my twenties. It wasn't until, interestingly, I achieved a certain level of success that I began to drink problematically. Um, and, uh, and into my 30s, uh, you know, all of a sudden, the things that I had been fighting for, I got, you know? Uh -huh. And so I feel like a certain pressure was lifted. Uh, and then I was at events with open bars all the time. And so mm -hmm. drinking became a kind of socially accepted way to navigate those rooms mm -hmm. and then you know, the entertainment industry is, is lousy with drinkers and, and partiers. It's a big part of, of what we do. And so I think almost unwittingly, you know, that part of my brain got triggered and turned on. And, uh, and so I found myself in my late 30s drinking and smoking. I was a daily pot smoker as well, more than I ever did in my 20s. And how did you realize, because one of the sort of symptoms of having a problem is that you don't see it. Right. Well, I was just so miserable. Ah, uh, me too. Yeah. yeah. I was so That's what it does. miserable. Yeah. And I looked around at my life and I, and objectively, I was like, there is no reason for me to be this unhappy, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, and, and the, the one, the, the most glaring 
component that was missing from my life was gratitude. That I couldn't be grateful, and yet I had so much mm -hmm. for which to be grateful. So, uh, so that was my my journey. I, you know, I didn't have a real like I didn't lose everything. I didn't no, I didn't ruin relationships. I, I had what I think people would refer to as a high bottom. Um, but there was just one day when I was like, I can't do this anymore. And it's so, had that insight. yeah, I'm grateful for I it. I think they, they say you can either be born an addict or use a lot. Uh -huh. And it sounds like you took the second route yeah. and I probably had, well, maybe a little of both. I think I had a little bit of both because that's the, yeah. the, the idea of what was your brain like before, right? Like I can remember being a kid uh, and I, I'll be interested in, in what your take is on this, but I can remember being a kid and my mom would buy, um, you know, like lunch, thing, like sh like desserts for lunch, like Twinkies or whatever, you know. And <laughs> she'd put them up in the in the cabinet above the the kitchen counter. And I would come home from school, and I would say, you know, can I have one? And she'd say, sure. And then I would wait until she was in the other part of the house, and I would climb up into the cabinet and have like three or four more. Mm -hmm. So my relationship to sugar mm -hmm. from a very young age, I can, yeah. I can really, you know, tr is that something yeah, that you find? that's very common with alcohol. Yeah, right. So definitely alcohol turns to sugar. Sure. And um, even mice that like to drink a lot of alcohol like sweets. Yeah. So it's a, it's a real genetic Is it mechanism. something you find in... The, in children who evolve into alcoholics? I think it's really a sensitivity of that reward pathway. Yeah. And that's why I was interested when you said you really, uh, it was kind of in check while you had a goal. Uh -huh. um, but then when there wasn't really a goal, then all of a sudden you were just overdoing it. I think that we're kind of made to seek. Mm -hmm. And um, for some people, and, you know, the reason drugs are. Um, Pleasurable, as you suggested earlier, the same reason that um, texts and food and um, sex are pleasurable is because they're, um, well, they uh, help us survive in a way, so they're newsworthy. And certainly food and sex are like the central things. We, we need to pay attention to those, and we need to find them important because then we'll live and we'll procreate. But I think that, um, and every single addict, any, every single thing that activates that same pathway is potentially addictive. Mm. So I think that one of the um, major risk factors and what's different ahead of time before we ever pick up is a sensitivity of that pathway. So how much are you a kind of acquisitive in general, looking for the next thing, opening the doors over the counter and then checking somewhere else? Mm -hmm. And some kids are are just more kind of still and content with what they have. And, mm -hmm. and some kids like us, not so much. Were you the same way as a child? Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I think I wore people out uh -huh. with that. Uh -huh. And, and I, I think if I, you know, I, it's interesting, the, um, the introduction, because I sometimes wonder now if I had had some challenging um, thing, like maybe developing an acting career, though I don't think that would have been it, but something that I could have done um, maybe I wouldn't have uh, been so drawn to drugs. And I think science, in a way, was kind of convenient for me because I had this ulterior motive, but I also think that the discovery process and the mystery and uncovering and collecting data, I mean, data, mm -hmm. especially if they're good, you know, that's Can a dopamine addictive. hit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. So what were you studying before? Uh, well, yeah, I, um, I started funny and by enough in biology, but that was sort of because my mother filled out my college applications and she thought I'd be good. I was, I was not too serious. Um, but I did have that tendency. And then I switched majors many times to philosophy, to English, to religion. Um, and then marine biology was my final one before I really hit bottom. Um, it took me seven years. So, and my goal there was just to float out in the ocean and mm. find single-celled organisms, I thought. Mm. That would be my cup of tea. I stoned out of my mind, you know, looking for it. <laughs> but uh, uh, when I went back, I, I picked psychology, and it was amazing to me because as I had been in college for about six and a half years and was not close to graduating, really. And then I got clean, and it was not that complicated. I, you know, it's a matter of showing up and studying, and all of a sudden, you know, I could pass the classes. Right. And so I switched to psychology thinking I was going to solve it. Um, and then neuroscience. 
So I, I think it was just a good fit. And what did you discover? I mean, what, what, what yeah. was your... Uh, what would I discover? You know, what, it's a reductive yeah. question, but what, you know, what did you come to in trying to solve this? And I'm, I'm really interested in this, the duality of that pursuit, you know? So uh, you came out of treatment and then you... I came out of treatment, I went to a halfway house, which was <clears> terrible. <throat> I stayed um, in Minnesota where I was for a year. Then I came back, finished school, kind of overloaded and got done. I don't know how I got into graduate school. It was kind of amazing. Um, and then I had a goal, sort of like your goal with acting. And I think that is really helpful. Mm -hmm. I think um, hopelessness or, or no imagination about the future being different is like lethal for yeah. people like me. Um, so uh, I guess then I just, you know, I was looking for like the next thing. And it's kind of pathetic in a way that I am one of those animals that, because I am chasing the next tail, chasing the next tail. I, I am very goal oriented. And um, so that was, you know, get a paper out, collect, you know, make a graph and do this. So I didn't look up much. I had to get my dissertation done. That took seven years. And then I was a little thinking at that point, wow, I'm not getting very far here. And actually it dawned on me about that time that the solution was going to, I wasn't maybe going to live long enough to see it mm -hmm. in the way I thought. But I didn't really know what else to do, mm -hmm. honestly. It was a kind of a tough, um, a tough place. And when I, it's not good for me to not know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not great with mm -hmm. extra time on my hands. So. Mm. Um, so while you were looking for the solution, what was your solution? How did you stay sober? Yeah, you know, I think and people ask me this a lot. It's so hard to describe. I, I made a, a zillion difficult choices. And I took a lot of help, and I used a lot of support. Mm -hmm. So I had all kinds of support, and um, and and some tough days and tough nights, mm -hmm. and still once in a while, you know, I'll get really down and think, "Geez, if I could just have a little scotch." Or I, I um, it took me, I say this in the book, but it took me nine years to stop craving marijuana. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally nine years. I yeah. really loved that drug. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Me too, And girl. then it went away. <laughs> I know. I know. It's so great, isn't it? So then, but get until this. Until it's not. Well, it went away. It was always great for, well, you're right, until it's not. But it was better than not. <laughs> yeah. So I, I wanted it, and then I got over it in nine years. So then I was probably, I got clean at 23. So it was probably like 35. Between about 35 and 50, I was fine. Mm. And then I hit menopause. Mm. I was like, oh my gosh, this is what it's for. <laughs> I, I already smoked my share, you know, yeah. I couldn't have any more, but I, I would fantasize about getting cancer and the doctor would say, you've got to have some marijuana. <laughs> I mean, I feel really, um, I don't know, and, and you know, uh, so, so I guess, you know, AA and 12 steps are something to touch on and we can. Um, but I, I feel like in my journey, and I, I'm, I'm a relative sober baby, you know, I mean, I'm coming up on three years sober in, uh, in May. Um, and I feel, you know, there is no part of me, uh, and so I'm interested in the science of this, there's no part of me that feels, at least right now, and in three years, and I had some really tough nights and days and tough decisions as well, but I got to a place eventually, I'd say nearing the end of my first year of sobriety, where there was just no part of me that thought it was a good idea. No matter whether I was in a great place, because when I was trying to regulate my drinking before I made the decision to stop entirely and, and pot, I would do this thing where I'd be like, well, I didn't drink for a month. So like, that's great. I can have a, I would celebrate with a drink. <laughs> Um, you know, or, uh, or I would stop smoking pot, so then I would drink more. I would stop drinking, so mm -hmm. I would smoke more pot. You know, I, was, I called it my shell game. Mm -hmm. So I would move the things around, and it was like, well, what shell is, is, is that fundamental emptiness, which I think is really what is at the heart of, of most addiction, that fundamental suffering, which shell is it under? Mm -hmm. um, but, but I got to a point where, like, I don't ever think or feel that taking a drink or smoking a, a joint is ever a good idea, you know? And, and, it's, and, and so what I'm left with 
is all of the other stuff, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what's more challenging for me sometimes, is like, oh, I have to feel this. Mm -hmm. Or I find other escapes for it, which are permissible, you know, like mm -hmm. food or sex or cigarettes or, you know, there are other outlets that, are, uh, that, that don't fall under that umbrella, but they still are attached to the same mm -hmm. fundamental emptiness. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really interested in the science of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also really interested in the science of what happens to recovering addicts' brains. Because mm -hmm. um, we know what happens to active addicts' brains, mm -hmm. right? They're reinforcing these neuropathways mm -hmm. that over time require more and more of whatever substance they're addicted to to elicit the same mm -hmm. response or the same Excellent. dopamine yeah. release, right? Yes, I love it. Um, and so, so what happens when people stop? Mm -hmm. And what, uh, are there discernible changes you know, and, and how does a program like AA or a 12 step program fit into those mm -hmm. changes? And what is your relationship to those programs as a scientist, uh, you know, and as a recovering mm -hmm. addict? Wow, there was about 50 Yeah, that's like 20 questions. There, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think going back to the, to the whole and the soul, yeah. um, it's interesting that we both had that. And I do agree that, um, that what, that what characterizes an addict is trying to fill that with substances. And, and then, of course, as you said, the more you try to fill it, the bigger it gets. So it's an impossible task. And I think getting clean requires kind of living with that existential hole for a while until... And I quickly shoved you know, note cards and study and exams and stuff in that because I couldn't bear being mm -hmm. still. Um, Eventually, and it, it took me much longer than you, and I, I think there's an explanation for that at the neural level. When you, when you go off the rails at 13 or 14 or 15, um, what happens is the brain is organized with those substances on board. So I really feel like taking, um, I mean, science bears this out, that using excessively as an adolescent changes your brain's structure and function forever. Mm -hmm. So by waiting till you were 30 to really get into it or later, you had an, a fully developed brain, a cortex that wasn't dependent and that wasn't hungry for it. So you can get that way, but it was much easier to probably back out. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying your recovery was easier than mine, but it sounds like you're more well than me. And if I could have been like you at three years, I, oh my gosh, mm. I, I, could, I wasn't. Um, I was pretty compulsive, and uh, you know, I was replacing it with um, Ben and Jerry's quite uh, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So. And um, I, and I, you know, that's a part of my journey also. You know that that there are those other sort of places mm -hmm. that I will look for the same feeling or the same, you know, to attempt to achieve that same feeling. So I don't mm -hmm. mean to oversell the, you know, I'm not like I got it, you know, but I, I'm just saying like there's no part of me that feels like. A drink is the answer. Yeah, so I still do. Not often. Um, it'll be it'll be a funny thing. Like I'll I'll have a really you know maybe once every two years I'll have a terrible day. Mm. I'll come home and I'll say to my husband, "Don't you want a drink?" Mm. He's not an alcoholic, you know. And I want him to have a drink mm. so I can <laughs> please. I mean, or or uh, like you know just a certain kind of weather or music and I'll think, oh my gosh, if I could just smoke a joint. Yeah. You know? And I, it comes out of the blue like that yeah. for me. So I think it's because I, I really um, did it early. I mm -hmm. think if you can, I tell my kids, um, if you can wait till you're 25, mm -hmm. then you can maybe enjoy it more safely. Mm -hmm. But I'm really interested, you know, we, when we talk about the kind of epidemic of addiction, mm -hmm. I think it is maybe at its heart, um, trying, you know, not having ways to work with that whole. And, and from a neuroscience perspective, that's not been my research. My research, you know, there's a kind of a joke, but we, we follow the smallest little arcane details because that's how you understand anything. So um, right now I'm studying sex differences and binge drinking that have to do with a GABA neurotransmitter and endorphins, but I mean it's, you know, n it's very tiny little thing. Not what is this mm. existential uh, challenge? But I I I feel like our inability to suffer mm. and to be still mm. in the face of heartbreak and mm. and tragedy 
Mm -hmm. which is still really hard for me. As I say it, I think, oh my yeah. gosh, it's something, um, is, is kind of a, a source of it. Yeah, I agree. And for kids today, I feel terrible because I think it must be harder now than it was, you know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s and there was a lot going on, but I think they're so aware of Well, we also emptiness. didn't have these, you know. It's like the kids today know how to work this world you know, we, I didn't have a cell phone until I got out of college, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I feel so grateful to be in, in that generation that grew up without mm -hmm. devices because that adds a whole other portal, mm -hmm. you know? And these jewels that the, you know, that like, that these kids are smoking mm -hmm. in high school, in mm -hmm. middle school, you know, yeah. like all, all these sort of advancements of technology that make deliver, they're, they're basically delivery systems, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, and you'd think maybe, well, if you have a phone, then you don't need a jewel, you don't need weed. But as we know, that's not how it works. Sure. The more you use, the more you sure. need. Yeah. So it actually makes the hunger larger. Yeah. Yeah. I owe everything to 12-step programs. Mm -hmm. So that's, my experience is similar with that. But I really recognize that most of us die in the gutter, whether or not we get there. Even So a lot of people get to those programs and it doesn't work for them for whatever reason. So um, the, it's just such a lethal disease. And I think um, you know, having us both sit here in the nice rug and we're all clean and everything, it's, it's <laughs> really it makes it look like it's a walk in the park, but obviously it's not a walk in the park. The, I don't study, I decided to focus on the problem and the book is really about the problem and I don't, I have my solution which was kind of a day at a time. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, science on that, it's interesting, shows that there is nothing more successful than 12 steps. Mm -hmm. And there's been millions of dollars spent to try to find more successful things, uh, partly because uh, AA is anonymous and not scientific and so you know, we have to have something to offer people that we can maybe even sell. And uh, there just isn't anything. But what that really means is that your chances of um, surviving breast or brain cancer are higher than your chances of surviving addiction. So it's just such a, a terrible is that true? disorder. It is true. Wow. Yeah, you know, brain cancer is not as, it's easier cured. More people are cured. Huh. Um, so we don't have a lot of, we don't have an easy solution at right. all. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, going back to your earlier points, the, uh, there's an 11th step in there, and that's really um, uh, been a long process for me of trying to get back to the reasons for my using. And, you know, instead of looking for a quick solution, um, which we know the neurobiology of that, you know, the impulsivity and the lack of self-regulation and the what feels good right now, that's what I want, mm. and I don't want to feel uncomfortable and I don't want to feel sad and I don't want to feel lonely. Um, so having to face all those things is part of it, but, uh, but also um, tra retraining the brain to mm -hmm. do those things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, you, you, you say the book focuses a lot on the problem. So can you talk a little bit about the neurological uh, predispositions? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there's, it's, it's what I mostly learned, I think you asked this earlier and I didn't answer, but what I mostly learned in 30 years as a neuroscientist is that it's really complicated. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> as I imagine most neuroscience is, yeah. but yeah. So we know about half the risk is um, genetic and biologic, and half of it is environmental. Uh -huh. And of the genetic part, even though we've cloned the genome, we know every single uh, nucleotide, you know, three billion of these things, um, we don't know which ones are really important. So we've explained only a tiny bit of the variance, and that comes down for alcohol, mostly to a liver enzyme. There's a couple of genes in the brain, but all together, those are maybe explaining, you know, 4% of the problem. Mm. The vast majority of the biologic or genetic influence is unexplained so far. And there's one group of people who think um, we just need more samples, we need more you know, genotyping. We need to get more and more and more and more and more fancy computers. AI is now going to help us with this because we can't quite get our heads around it. And then there's another group of people um, who sort of 
view this as a gloomy prospect. That's the official name. The gloomy prospect is that there's so many genes and they're having such tiny effects and some of them are protecting and some of them are making you more at risk and they combine in such a complicated way. It's, it's in other words, there'd be as many ways to become an addict as there are addicts. Mm -hmm. um, and then the environment is much worse mm -hmm. because the environment is not things like, you know, was, you know, were you raised in an alcoholic home or, um, you know, your socioeconomic status or anything, or, you know, very little of it, again, is explained. So it's, it's just, um, my view now is that becoming a drug addict is sort of a natural brain response to um, having all these opportunities for using everywhere and a, a biological predisposition to begin with. Maybe. Mm -hmm. So, but we're, <clears throat> the people who are addicts are kind of the canaries in the coal mine mm -hmm. about what are the environmental mm -hmm. triggers. Now, and everybody would get there. From, yeah, from that standpoint, I mean, can you take somebody who doesn't have the genetic or biological disposition, predisposition to addiction and put them in such a horrific environment that they develop an addiction yeah. as a result so that they don't have, and, and conversely, can you take someone who has that genetic or biological predisposition and put them in such a nurturing, supportive, and loving environment that they don't develop an addiction? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I was from a pretty nurturing, supportive, loving family. Um, it's, I mean, maybe that's a little overstated, but uh, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a terrorist camp by any means. It was okay. I, I think um, the answer is both. So if anybody uses enough, they'll become dependent. So their brain will create the exact opposite um, situation that the drug produces. So if the drug produces relaxation, your brain produces anxiety. If the drug reduces suffering, your brain causes pain. So it kind of is always going to do that. The more you use. Yeah, the more you use. Um, but I, And I think there are a lot of people who have the genetic predisposition but don't develop it because they never pick up. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people who say, you know, I saw this in my family, and they are basically just like us, but they never unmask they don't it. They activate with, it. With use. So I think, yeah, there's, it could be, I always think maybe you need 100 points. I might have been born with 60, and then it didn't take long, and you may have been born with fewer, but, you know, as a result of all those Hollywood parties, you know, added it in. And then we get to 100 points, and at that point, at that time, there's really not a choice, as you said. So at that point, it's compulsive using. The, it's not free, and it's desperate. Mm -hmm. And that's when it's so hard to take a hard look in the mirror mm -hmm. and say, you know, I got to do it different. Mm -hmm. And so what happens when people stop? Um, I'm interested in that statistic about, you know, the the... Uh, likelihood of success, um, but but what happens? So you know, if you've been able to recognize from a scientific perspective that twelve-step programs are the most effective treatment for addiction, um, to to what is that attributable, and what happens to the brains of people that engage twelve-step programs differently? So. This, it's not my area of research, but I go to research on alcoholism meetings all the time. And this is a really interesting question. I don't know if it'll, I'll be able to convey it. So these, these are um, really complicated statisticians you know, who are drawing arrows from um, getting support group, having something to do, getting up on time. You know. So they have all the factors that they can see in a 12-step program, helping other people, drinking a lot of coffee, whatever. And so they have all these boxes and all these arrows with numbers. And the bottom line is they, again, only account for a minority of the variants. And they'll stand at the board and they'll say, well, we just, the biggest factor, we don't know what it is. We can't explain it. Hmm. There's a mystery to it. There is a definite mystery to it. So it's not... Well, in the fundamental, you know... The, the, the central kind of idea um, around a 12-step program is a spiritual one, right? I mean, it is about that existential whole, isn't it? So, so I thought they were providing evidence for that because they had uh, the arrow uh -huh. with a big question mark. Uh -huh. But, uh, I, I, 
you know. But there's something they're unexplainable so about it. Yeah, you know? and there is something inexplicable. Yes. Yeah. Inexplicable. I mean, you know, one of the challenges, uh, you know, so so the notion that an addict is forever uh, sick, right? Even in recovery. How does that line up to the neuroscience? I think our whole ideas of sick and well are nuts. Uh-huh. I mean, is anybody well? <laughs> and, and, no, and I mean, and I also think, when, you know, when I was studying psychology initially, they would say, you know, this person has this problem and they're sick. I really think it's all in a continuum. And mm-hmm. some of us are vulnerable, so we get there first. Mm-hmm. But the conditions that, you know, that are catalyzing us moving down this thing, like alienation. I mean, I really, going back to your point, I think addiction is at its core a disease of alienation. Mm-hmm. And look at our society. Mm-hmm. We, we have whole families, like each person is like this, they don't even talk mm-hmm. to each other. We don't know our neighbors. I mean, mm-hmm. I guess you guys do, because you live close yeah, together. But sure. um, <laughs> hopefully, but we're alienated from ourselves, yeah. from our spirits, yeah. from our bodies, from our children. Yeah, I mean, our culture has not evolved in a way that's making it any easier to stay connected to ourselves or to one another. And I do think that, that that's, you know, troubling. Um, and that may be the cause of the increasing right, incidence. Right, right. You know, we, well, just the, I mean, there's there's a pervasive hopelessness, isn't there now? And and I think our world, um, certainly in our country, um, you know, and if you look at at the you know boggling opioid epidemic, you know, this is a drug that is designed to numb, mm-hmm. right? This is a drug oh, that's designed to completely. It, it absolutely is the antidote to suffering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking about the power of addiction, and maybe the power of addiction is to show us um, what in our environment is so untenable, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And what is hard to bear? What is is the thing that we can't hold for ourselves? Um, Should we open, should we get questions now? Or do you want to keep going? I don't want to interrupt you. I just. I'm down. uh, It's like dark out there, but I don't know if this is a good time. I I really didn't want to. Tim thinks it's a good time, don't you, Tim? I think it's a good time to say um, thank you to the two of you for being so brave and coming out so openly about these issues. because, Zach, I remember you told me you wanted to help, and by your example, and, 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 and Judy, by yours, with your book, um, you know, knowing how others have gone through what you might be going through um, actually forges a community, which might have been lacking otherwise. And maybe the community aspect is something that we need to talk about a little more. But you are a community here right now, and so we just want to honor your presence with um, taking your questions. But uh, you might have a life story to tell us, but, and I know this is the context in which that life story could be very relevant, but do just keep it as short as you can, just so that we have time enough to accommodate as many people as possible. And of course, you will have time to talk to Judy afterwards when, um, when uh, she signs your book, which I hope you'll want to get now after you've heard her. Who would like to be the first two? We've got one in the first row. Cecilia, let's come right down here first. There we go. And sorry, was there somebody on that side of the house? Yes, right in the third row. Thank you. I work with borderline personality disorder, and those people very often can't benefit from uh, 12-step programs because it starts out with, I am an addict, which induces an enormous amount of shame. And I think neurobiologically, you have a basis for alienation and sense of emptiness in the singular. You can go into the biology of it. And I just wondered if you're familiar with any of the work where they're looking at buprenorphine in low doses to bring people's opioid system up to where normals are. In other words, is there some imbalance Mm -hmm. in the opioid system to start out with that makes them want to regulate? Are they actually self-medicating when they do all of this? There's a ton of evidence that addicts are self-medicating. Um, And and they start out before, so more anxious, more depressed, and even low endorphins. What's uh, a problem, though, is that the natural neurochemicals are up and down, kind of like an orchestra. It's not like a constant, you know, C going, 
And so that, you really can't mimic it. And when we describe the normal neurochemistry, I should just say, for the record, we don't know what the normal neurochemistry is. And there is not sort of a normal neurochemistry. So it depends on your age, it depends on your, um, your set gender, and uh, lots of things. So neurochemistry is like a, a river. It's constantly moving and constantly changing. And there's no way we know of to put something in there. So if you give, I'm, I'm for a buprenorphine to, in a transitional time, but I think that in the long run, it doesn't contribute to freedom. It, uh, it, uh, not to usurp the question time no. from the audience, but uh, we were talking also a little bit before, I, I'm, I just started that Michael Pollan book, How Do You, How Do you Change Your Mind? How to Change Your Mind. Um, so there is this kind of new wave of thinking about um, psychedelics, LSD and psilocybin as, uh, uh, you know, and ketamine too, right? Ketamine uh, is actually not. I, we wouldn't put that in that. I wouldn't. You put wouldn't put it in a psychedelic category, right? No, I mean it's it's something to do, but it's not. <laughs> it's uh, mescaline, uh, psilocybin, LSD. I know, but that's a different drug. It, these this class of drugs: mescaline, LSD, psilocybin, and DMT or and ayahuasca. DMT, yeah. Those are the four that we yeah, know of. Yeah. Um, are different. Uh, neurochemically and pharmacologically than ketamine or mm -hmm. MDMA, mm -hmm. right. which are in different categories. Right. Yeah. I'm. I'm interested. You know, I have. I've spoken here on this stage about my experiences with ayahuasca, uh, of which I've had many, and uh, and and I'm interested in this idea of. I mean, I, you said something before about like what was so, so. So just talk a little bit about that. Uh, so yeah. My, my my. It's funny. Now I can say this. My. My real goal was to be able to drop acid on Easter. Uh -huh. For some reason, I thought that would be a good idea. Uh -huh. um, so if I couldn't use normally, at least if I could once a year. Um, and I think maybe, I say this in the book, it might be the insights I got from those class of drugs that enabled me to get clean. Uh -huh. And there are some, um, there are some, there's some evidence that people um, can recover better uh -huh with the insight that they get from mm -hmm. those things. And mm -hmm. they're also um, benefiting um, if they're terminally ill mm -hmm. and or, or dealing with other sort of, kind of a, for me, it might have been like a psychological immaturity. Mm -hmm. And I think that the experience of psychedelics, those four, right. it, first of all, none of, those four drugs are not addictive. Now, ketamine is addictive. MDMA is addictive. But these do not release dopamine right. in that pathway. Um, they're not self-administered by anybody but humans, right. really. And I think there may be some therapeutic benefit. They're right. not, it's, it's kind of uh, ironic because these are highly, highly regulated. Yeah. But right. there's not really a lot of evidence of harm as there is with alcohol that's sort of unregulated. Yeah, it's something I think that's really capturing a moment now, um, mm -hmm. this whole movement toward microdosing and mm -hmm. using it to um, alleviate symptoms of depression, anxiety, addiction. Um, you, know, you know, as a pharmacologist, though, I would say, and I don't know, I think it's an empirical question, uh -huh. but I'm not expecting a panacea. Sure. Coming from a chemical. everybody's experience is yeah, different. Yeah, and the reason I haven't gone back to LSD is because I thought, you know, I've, I've, I know what it does. Mm -hmm. I've seen that, and mm -hmm. I benefited from that. Yeah. And I think going back would be a little bit like um, mistaking the um, finger for the moon. You know, uh, it's interesting. Like, I think, and and this is kind of a general message too. Every single thing any drug does um, is only to mimic. It either speed up or slow down what your brain is already doing. Right. It doesn't do anything new. Right. So what those drugs can do is help us, you know, qu more quickly. Right. Um, there's also I don't know. Do you know about iboga, ibogaine? Uh, ibogaine, yeah. Yeah. It's it's a little bit. Um, it's an interesting. It's related drug. It's to nice. ayahuasca, the, but not. The clinical trials have not been so great uh, with that. Uh -huh. um, there was a person actually from New York who was really cured of his heroin addiction. Right. By Ibogaine, and um, it's it's approved. It's um, a campersate uh -huh. in the clinic, um, but it's what's a uh, campersate? It's Ibogaine, but it's the oh, it's name the where they I make see, a lot of money with it. Uh -huh. yeah, so. <laughs> Interesting. So the chemical, like the it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. so it's the uh, formulation that is um, is 
now approved for treatment of alcoholism. It's not wildly successful. It's not. I, I just don't think the answer's coming in a bottle. Sure, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, a question in a bottle. Hi, um, you spoke near the end about spirituality and feeling, you know, one of the sort of sources of addiction might be this existential angst. Um, you know, I use meditation sometimes as a form of whenever I get cravings to sort of just analyze my feelings and sort of deal with it head on and then move on. And, you know, just curious if that kind of meditation has factored into your lives or if there's any research on it. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, yes. Yes. Uh, I meditate twice a day, TM. Uh, you know, that to me has become especially recently, actually, like an incredibly important part of my day and part of my experience. And like, I'll, I'll just really make sure to carve. And I, and I ebb and flow with it. I mean, I wish I could say I've done it every day since I got sober or I do it every day, period. That's not true. Um, but, I, but I definitely notice the difference. Um, my ability to get in between myself, my ego self, and whatever thoughts I might be having that are challenging that sense of well-being uh, is noticeably heightened and, uh, and sharper when I'm meditating myself. So meditation is a huge part of just well-being in general, but yeah, definitely sobriety as well. And I'm sure there's tons of research about well, it's it. It's right? funny, you again beat me to the, uh, to the end. It took me about uh, 15 years to be willing to sit still. Uh. I, I just resisted this so much. I mean, I did not want to sit still. And I didn't want to feel the emptiness, honestly. So that's why I was constantly. Mm. And it's still tough for me, I think. So I admire people who can just do it. But eventually, like everything else, you know, I was brought to my knees and mm. Um, I would now rather be without food and water, I think. So I'm, I'm still a, kind of a baby about it, getting there. Mm. But um, it, I definitely notice a difference. The, the neuroscience on it is fascinating. Mm. It's really, I mean, ADHD, depression, addiction. It seems like there's nothing, uh, you know, intelligence that isn't benefited by that kind of... Um, connecting with something bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. I, and just being, I mean, yeah. TM for me was a real breakthrough because I had, I had tried other forms of meditation, um, Shambhala meditation, uh, Tonglen, and uh, you know, spiritually associated meditations, which were always so much harder for me. You know? But when I went to the TM training, I found there was something so accessible about it. I was like, wait, I can sit in a chair? Like that is, you know, I don't have to be totally uncomfortable, you know. Um, there's something in that that just made me want to do it more, you know. And there's something, I don't know, it feels very user friendly um, for anybody who's, you know, for me it made a real difference. And, you know, I, I really valued and appreciated the spiritual um, correlates to the other kinds of meditation that I was doing. But I, I couldn't bring it into my daily life. And so uh, anybody who's curious about it, I would recommend, you know, that path or you know, researching that path. It's, it's powerful. Yeah, and of course, uh, at the Rubin, meditation is not exactly our bread and butter or our wafer, but uh, we do actually have mindfulness meditation sessions on Wednesdays that are free to members, um, every Wednesday lunchtime is at one. But uh, from the brainwave um, perspective, Tracy Dennis, who's a neuroscientist um, at Hunter College, she's been here several times, and she's worked in schools um, where... Uh, which are very poor and, and don't have enough funding and, and uh, there's a, a lot of abuse um, in various descriptions that the students have uh, suffered from and they have real difficulties concentrating. And so she's been introducing meditation, but then also studying, you know, with, with one class gets to meditate, one class gets to do something that looks like meditation but isn't, and, and really evaluating the results. And of course, you know, the students who meditate are able to do better at class because they find that they're better able to concentrate. And it's the reduction of anxiety that I think is, is the most valuable immediate return. And so she's going to be part of Brainwave on the 27th of um, April 
in a workshop with an artist, Candy Chang, who last year, I don't know whether you came and saw the, the a monument to the anxious and the hopeful um, as you entered on the, on the wall, on the west wall by the staircase, where uh, over, um, I think, like 50,000 people in the course of the year posted what they were anxious about or what they were hopeful about. Um, and so we're doing a workshop um, to analyze the results of that. So those submissions, your submissions, um, of where you are in the barometer of New York anxiety, um, but also what tools that you might leave with to better enable you to navigate um, the stuff that happens. And again, you know, the, the essential mantra of this all is, it's not what happens to you, because shit happens to all of us, but it's how you handle it. And that practice and what all this art tries to do for you is put you in a place to understand those ramifications and those connections, but understand them intrinsically, not just intellectually. Do we have another question? Yes, over here, and anybody on this side? Yes, in the second row here, please, Cecilia, thanks. Hello. Hi. Um, as a sufferer of depressive episodes, intermittent um, or recurring depressing depressive episodes since I was 15. I've done a lot of research on um, the origins of depressions and theories of why it has, um, it's such uh, epidemic uh, in the modern world. Now, I've come across Stephen Alardi's, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, uh, theory that depression, at least in its clinical form, is a disease purely of civilization that when we were hunter-gatherers, the constant moving and um, being in communities and eating nutritionally fulfilling foods made it impossible to develop clinical depression. I'm wondering whether you think addiction is the same, um, that it is strictly a disease of civilization, or as humans, do you believe that we inherently have this predisposition towards addiction and that civilization in the way it's progressed is just making it easier to succumb to? Great question. Um, you know, uh, we, since the beginning of time, we have been changing the way we feel. So this is so, using drugs is so not new. Um, before written words, people were taking, uh, having pictures of magic mushrooms on the walls that are 6,000 years old or 8,000 years old. Um, fermented fruit. So we, and not only humans, by the way, non-human animals. My, my favorite story is of these, um, if you don't mind, uh, there's a, a species of ants in South America that uh, nurtures these little beetles in their colony. So they have this big ant house, and then there's a nursery for beetles, and it takes them, they have to feed them and clean them and take care of them because the beetles grow this fungus on the back of their legs. And then what the ants do a few times a year is they collect all the fungus, they all eat it, and they get really slow for like two days. <laughs> and there's no nutritional value. I mean, but birds and elephants and cats with catnip, I mean, it's just, it's nothing novel. But what is different, um, and I, I love your question for this, is using alone. So Zachary said this, he found himself sitting in his apartment, smoking weed by himself. That's new, that is industrialization. So, you know, people would sit around a kiva and share the pipe. We don't do that anymore because the pipe's mine. Yeah, that's new. <laughs> so we get back to the idea of community and <coughs> connectivity, which balances out yeah. the sort of needs and desires to some extent. I mean, you, you said earlier on, uh, Judy, that um, you know, we are primed uh, for our survival sake to hunt and gather. And the rewards that we get from successfully hunting something or getting that little red berry on the bush that doesn't poison us, does that thing, oh good, we can survive another day, right? So we are primed to do that sort of activity, um, but within and for the benefit of community as opposed to mm -hmm. The self. And, and going, so that's a great point, and it reminded me that um, the highest incidence in the U.S. of addiction is on Native American reservations, where it's kind of the antithesis of an opportunity to hunt and gather. There's no jobs, there's, um, you know, really no opportunity, no, nothing, there's a lot of alcohol. 
And so I think that um, if we had more ways to support each other in um, healthy hunting and gathering, whatever that looks like, you know, channeling that urge, then it wouldn't be so appealing to sit on the couch and get loaded, you know? All right, well, let's gather another question. Yes, hello. Yeah. love marijuana but you've been able to give that up however you still get tempted with alcohol I was wondering what is the difference between the two do you give yeah. what do you give more power to and if what makes you think that you'll be addicted again if you just have a little bit of scotch that what you want yeah, to yeah I I never loved alcohol it was just so handy um, but I would take everything that I could get I I do have cravings for alcohol. I have cravings for marijuana. The only thing I don't crave is Coke, which I think is evil. <laughs> it's just a brutal drug. But other than the stimulants, I, I occasionally have this idea. And often it's stress, often it's alienation, often it's self-pity and a lack of gratitude. So gratitude is the antidote. But I forget sometimes. Um, I just think it's the way I'm built, which maybe you could say is kind of immature because I want a quick fix. And I, I still am kind of that way. That's why I think it took me so long to try to meditate. Like, don't tell me I have to sit still and wait. You know, it's, it's not fair. So, um, yeah, no, I don't, I, you know, I'm not sure because I'm a scientist and the only way you can really be sure is to get the data. But it would be sort of like proving that I can't fly by jumping off a roof and dying. You know, I, I don't want to do that experiment. So I think... When I'm really honest with myself, I don't want a little scotch. I want the whole bottle, still. And I don't know what that is in me. It's just, like, there is not enough. Too much is still not enough for me. So then it's just, it's more fun in a way and free to just say, no, I don't. That's another reason I don't like the Suboxone thing, because it seems like you're being on a diet at a holiday party perpetually, you know? just miserably trying not to go over the thing. If it's just off the table for me, I spend my money on plane tickets, you know, and ski lift things and music concerts. Um, I don't, I don't, I just, I sort of did that. I don't think there's anything new there for me. Thank you. Uh, who else? Let's take a question right at the back of the house. Uh, Tony, thank you in the back row. And also, yes, back here, Cecilia, you've got one. Yes, thank you, great. Yes, hello. Yes, Hi. Hello. Um, can you, you both mentioned social media as this new form of addiction that's epidemic in our society right now. Um, can you speak more about the research behind how our brain changes when we use social media chronically um, and whether there are any permanent uh, changes? Mm -hmm. And do you think we should treat social media and other forms of technology with the same sort of urgency um, as we treat addiction to drugs? The easiest way to answer that is, um, imagine if I took your phone for two weeks. Um, so every time there's a, a, a text or a ding or a Facebook update or whatever it is, a little squirt of dopamine comes out. And the more of those, so those were meant to be when you um, see an impala that you're going to hunt down or you, uh, you know, find a really ripe piece of fruit or a you know, potential mate, something yummy. Not every, you know, nine milliseconds. So I think that the constant um, exposure to dopamine makes us a little deaf to dopamine. Just like if you're constantly eating ice cream, you're a little deaf to insulin. And what does that do? It makes you more hungry. And so here now my, my dopamine system has been overstimulated. So it's um, it kind of, it's, it's deaf. And so I need to turn up the volume. And I need, you know, another phone that gets it faster. And I need mm -hmm. five, you know, whatever it is that we're going for next, LTEs or something. Sure. Anyway, you know, I need, to, <laughs> I need more of it. I need more. And so I think it's insatiable. And the way you, you know, an addictive path is a path that uh, is a dead end. You know, that you never get enough of, that never isn't satisfying. And so... And it's also created this false reality as well so alienation alienation it's like you know we become obsessed with what other people are doing and you know there's this great documentary uh 
that Andy Timoner made called We Live in Public. Uh, and it was about an ex a social experiment that happened at the, at the turn of the millennium um, <clears throat> where sh they took like all of these people and put them in a bunker. And they basically examined and explored what would happen if those people, they got everything they wanted. They had all the food, all the drink, all the socialization <clears throat> that they wanted. The only thing that they had to agree to was to be filmed the entire time that they were there. And so it was a social experiment about what happens to a society that is constantly being witnessed in living their lives. And, it, and, it, and within a very short amount of time, it, and this was before social media and the advent of all these social media platforms, but everything broke down and people's senses of self and their relationships to one another completely disintegrated. And, 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 you know, and, and we create these false selves. I mean, we all do it you know, on, on Instagram and on social media that's like, you know, this is what I'm doing, what are you doing? You know? Uh, and it, and it, I think in addition to the dopamine release, it also has this tail that comes around and, and whacks you in the side of the head, which is, I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. So it's like the dopamine release of getting the validation because this many thousands of people liked my photo or whatever. Uh, and then like the, the smack of like, <sighs> well, I'm not as good as that person. So I, I mean, I do think there's an urgency to it, but I also think that it's, irrevocable now. I don't think there's any way for us to put the toothpaste back in the tube. I think that people, though, who've um, gotten themselves lost in an addiction might be able to uh, help with that. Yeah. Because I think, and, and maybe also people who know how to meditate or people who are artists, you know, people who have, there might be in children, and uh, I have a 16-year-old now, so I hear from her friends, too, that they are uh, pretty skeptical of these sort of things. I think they're addicted to them, but they also recognize the emptiness uh -huh. so more quickly than I did, for sure. Well, that's good for Maybe. Them, that generation. Yeah, I, hope we'll that, I hope that's true. I, I hope it's true, too. Yeah. Judy, you said, you said that you know, when you know, the, the ping goes off uh, on your phone, just uh, you've got a message or whatever, you, there's a dopamine hit. But quite frankly, when I hear the vibration in my pocket or the, the ping go off. I get anxiety, but who wants huh. something from me, so you know? That, is, <laughs> no, that anxiety is what you get when you're gonna do cocaine in a regular way too. It's not pleasant, ah. it's just, it's telling you something important is happening uh -huh. that you don't really even, like it's a love-hate thing. Uh, okay. if, if you really don't, then turn the ping off, you know? We, we don't do that. So cocaine addicts are not enjoying it. They feel, um, they, I think, uh, and certainly this was the case for me, it's a kind of like, oh my gosh, I got to do it. Don't like it. Mm -hmm. Don't like myself. Don't want to be here. Yeah. But <coughs> let me call the dealer. Right. Yeah. Got it. Um, Tony, uh, there's a question right at the back. Uh, after Way in this, the back. Uh, right at the, the back row. Right at the back row, Tony. Yes, go. who's got the microphone here? Yeah, thank you. Hi. 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 Uh, just, uh, just a quick a question. Second. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, let's okay. take this lady first and then we'll come to you. Sorry to keep you waiting. Um, so I think a lot of the discussion thus far has focused on addiction and its relationship with the individual. Um, and I think that to me it sounds like this is something that if you work hard enough as a person or take the right steps, you might be able to self-care. And I think that there's a huge systemic piece that we haven't discussed discussed yet. And I'd be curious to hear your perspective on the current kind of almost political climate of the things we're hearing about with drug companies and, and all these other factors that are contributing to our nation's crisis um, and how that interacts with what you've studied. Yeah, um, I think if there's a will, there's a way. And if, if it's not drug companies, I'm, I'm maybe in the minority here, It'll be in, you know, I'll be making something in my bathtub with, you know, Drano or something. So I think that the way to get to the, I, I think it's going to be more solutions on the demand side than in the supply side. It's just, I just think the supply side is infinite. It's not going to stop. So um, now I, I think you might have, so I, I don't, I think drug companies are greedy pigs, but we all know that, you know, in a way. Sorry. Um, so I think 
Uh, but what about um, the, you mentioned other systemic things. So I don't know if you meant like the um, just anxiety of living that we were trying to talk about or? Even more simple than that, um, poverty, how communities are constructed nowadays. <coughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I think um, <coughs> it's difficult to, uh, so suffering comes from seeing all of these things and or experiencing them ourselves. And I think the desire to escape from that is what motivated me. I mean, and we all, and that's part of the human condition. So I, I think that the lack of connections in neighbors and in communities and schools, the lack of um, family connections sometimes, I, I think it is a, a good environment for um, and the lack of opportunities lack and of opportunities. Yeah, corporatization no, and agree. globalization of economies and outsourcing of jobs and you know we are we are a declining empire uh, there's no two ways about it so it's like you know the the circumstances of that whether you're experiencing them or witnessing them or the suffering in other parts of the world the environment you know the the reality of global warming and climate change and the impact that that's having already and is going to continue to have on our planet. I mean, there, there, is, there are these things which I think eventually come down to our species, the human drive toward advancement at any cost, you know, which, which we are <coughs> hardwired to pursue, even, even in the context of our own destruction. So it's like, we're living in the midst of this thing that as much as we want to stop it, we can't. And so, you know, yeah, I mean, I think all of that is mm -hmm. true, but I think it's also what, what we have to do in a way is kind of, you know, there is a consciousness, I think, ultimately, that there is a shift in consciousness that, that is happening and has to happen in order for there to be prosperity on a fundamental human being level. And I think we're starting to see that more now. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't change, you know, the inequities of this society that we live in. Um, but eventually, you know, there'll be enough catastrophe, I think, that we'll have no choice but to recognize the humanity <coughs> that tr transcends our differences. And that seems to be the kind of moment that we're living through in yeah, a lot of ways. Yeah, so it kind of what I hear you saying is that addiction is a symptom of those... Um, structures and institutions and ways of being. And I think I agree, really. Yeah. And would you say a lack of purpose? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Disconnection from ourselves, from each other, from a purpose, yeah. yeah. Sorry to have kept you waiting all this while. Hello. Thank you. I'm just curious about both of your perspectives on legalization of uh, recreational marijuana and how that can potentially legitimize what was erstwhile an illegal drug and hence therefore contribute to a lowered entry barrier and hence increased levels of addiction. Just curious. I, I find that an interesting question. Um, you know, that wave has already crested uh, in so many areas in our country, uh, the legalization of marijuana. Um, I remember when I was when I, you know, I did a lot of my pot smoking, well, here too, but I lived in LA before I moved to New York, and, you know, I used to have to find a deal, you know, like I had a pot dealer that would come to my house, or that I would meet in a part, you know, like whatever, I would cop drugs, right? And now I drive through LA, and there's like, you know, call this number, go into MedMen, you know, do the, you know, and, and, and so it is a, I think there are economic benefits to it. I mean, I think if you look at alcohol as a legalized substance and you compare it to marijuana, I, I'm of the mind that there are, there are fewer um, hazards to, to the drug marijuana, you know, in terms of impairment, in terms of, and I mean, you can't walk down the street in, in New York without catching a whiff of somebody vaping or smoking a joint. I mean, it's everywhere we go now. So I think it's, it's a train that's left the station. So my feeling about it is actually how can we be responsible about it at the level of, because the other thing that's happening is like the pot that you were smoking as opposed to the pot that kids today are smoking, it's like 
you know, it's crazy, modified and intensified. And, you know, so how can we be responsible at the production level, actually? Um, and how can we uh, make sure that customers are aware of what they're buying and knowing the doses when they're, you know, edibles are a huge thing. But like the problem with edibles is like how much THC is in this gummy? You know, you could eat one gummy from one store and one gummy from another and somebody could be tripping their face off you know, and somebody else is like, I don't really feel anything. So how can we regulate and make sure the consumers know what they're getting? So for me, I actually, you know, I don't look at it as a question of whether or not it will be legalized because it basically already is. I look at it as a question of how can we be responsible and support an industry that's emerging into the mainstream marketplace and hold them accountable for the products that they're distributing to customers. Uh, and I actually... You know, I have relationships with marijuana companies and, and, and plant companies, uh, genetic plant companies that are doing genetic testing to make sure that, you know, because if you're at a dispensary in L.A., right, and there's some dude working at the counter and they run out of OG Kush and he walks into the back and grabs a handful of something else and throws it in the container, like, how do you know as the consumer what you're getting? Um, so I actually support and work with companies that are actually, that is their purpose, uh, and I also support and work with companies that are uh, really pursuing the medical value of marijuana, THC, and CBD. Because I think, you know, I don't use it anymore, but I think there is value to it if it is used responsibly and if it's marketed and, and manufactured responsibly, grown, harvested, and produced responsibly. So that's where my attention is, and I find it fascinating to be a part of those conversations in, in a really emerging industry. Um, okay, so here comes the bitter pill. I don't know, we've been talking about things like this. Um, we've only got time for one more question. So uh, <clears throat> just know that uh, Dr. Judith Grizel will be upstairs signing copies of her book. Um, and you might find that, in fact, one copy is never enough. Um, <laughs> one is plenty. Because, as we've alluded to, you probably have a friend who needs this, but still. Um, pardon the joke. But still, it's a really good book, and as you've heard, Judith's story is an amazing one, and she can speak from an experience that translates into her studies with um, an authority that very few neuroscientists can muster. So, um, Judy, thank you so much for, for bringing this book to us. Um, so, all right, I said we have one question le left, and who wants to ask the question? We've got three people. Um, okay, so who's never asked a question in public before, ever? Okay. Third row. You might be lying, but we're going to give you the mic anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Cecilia, go for it. Thank you so much. I'm going to breathe. Um, I am actually a parent of an addict. And I could see very early on, I'm a therapist by trade, and I could see very early on there were signs of addiction. It started actually with comic books. Mm. And then I, I, uh, I'm also a, a person who loves classical music, and I took my daughter to a concert thinking that would be a wonderful introduction. And uh, it was wonderful, but she was also so emotionally moved that there were people around me who were upset because she became overwhelmed by the music and was um, crying. <clears throat> my question is, is there science behind those who are able to survive versus those who don't. And in speaking about um, these things and the uh, research that's being done to make us want to use these more, are they sharing any of that data with scientists? Do we know? I mean, you read articles about in Silicon Valley, the people who work there won't allow their children to have access to phones and, and signing contracts with their nannies that app, under no circumstances are their kids to be exposed to these things. So clearly they know something that we don't. And how do we access that so we can maybe utilize that to save people versus addict them? I'm really not an expert on the phone addictions. I think I'm, I'm in it with you. You know, I mean, we're all doing this experiment and we'll see. Um, I do think 
putting it away and taking a holiday is a great idea. As far as um, predicting who's going to develop an addiction or who's going to get well, is that? Yeah, it's a really interesting disease because it's the only one I know of where the worse off you are um, when you start, the, the more likely you are to survive. So I think it takes a certain amount of willingness and truth-telling. And for me, and for Zachary, I guess it was, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with what I'm doing, and I, I have to be willing to do something different. And that's more likely if things are bad than if they're good. So um, unlike, you know, cancer, where if the tumor's small, it's great. Here, if it's real small, you can kind of ignore it. So it's nice to have the consequences. Um, I also think that uh, support and an opportunity to go to a good nonprofit treatment center is, was helpful for me. I never, I don't think would have made it without that. But um, it's, so I don't think there's an easy answer. And, I, and it's, the science isn't really able to predict. Any final um, words before we wrap up from either of you um, that you want to share with people? I just am really looking forward to reading the book. Yeah. Yeah. I love the mix of your personal experience with, uh, with what you've learned, and I love that what you've learned is an extension of your recovery. Um, that feels uniquely uh, inspiring and, uh, and insightful. So I feel grateful for the opportunity to chat with you and to learn. And um, yeah, it also reinforces my commitment to staying sober. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you, everybody. Yeah. It's really nice to be here.